good morning. It's lovely that the days are getting longer and hopefully we're all using the re relaxation of the uh, COVID restrictions that we're connecting with people, we're spending time with people outdoors. Just can I encourage you to do that, especially with people from our church family, because we are made to be family together and we have to experience that as best we can physically together uh, within the restrictions. Because so I can just encourage you to do that. And we're continuing through the uh, Sermon on the Mount. This is the second um, series in a trilogy of series. And this is the last sermon in the series. We'll end uh, the chapter five today. So just let me read the uh, passage for today. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy. And <laughs> I should reread that again. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If last week, turning the other cheek, don't retaliate, was foolish in the eyes of the world, this, it would seem, is utter madness. Love your enemies. What kind of person loves their enemies? Now, most of us don't really have enemies, not real enemies today. Someone who just is consumed with wanting to harm you to, and they act on it. And Jesus uses the term enemy when he tells a, the, a parable of someone who, uh, an enemy who comes to someone's field full of corn and plants it full of weeds and does major damage to the person. This is an enemy. This is someone who wants to do major damage to you or to your family or to your career. They, they think about it all the time, inflicting pain and destruction on you, and they will do it if they can. That's what an enemy is. It's way past just not liking someone. Now, in the wisdom of the world, it would say, when you have an enemy, get your retaliation in first. If they seek your destruction, you seek theirs before they have a chance to harm you. And Jesus is saying of those people, these people, love them. Now here, love isn't a feeling or a desire, or like a, a desire, but it is the will to do good. Remember we said when you love someone, you promote their good for their own sake. So Jesus is saying, act towards your enemy for his good or her good. And he says, love your enemy, that's the illustration, so that, or in order that, you might be sons and daughters of your heavenly Father. Remember, all through this uh, series, we've been saying the wrong question is to ask us, what should we do? And the right question is, what type of heart should we have? What kind of person should we be? And all the illustrations, all the way back going to anger, is pointing to a kind of person, a person whose heart resembles the Father's heart. What Jesus is saying here in this final illustration is that by loving our enemies, even praying for them, we take on, if you like, the heart or the nature of our Heavenly Father. It's the kind of heart the Father has. He gives good things like rain and sun on the good and on the wicked, on those who love him and those who spit at him. And then Jesus says, you know what? Terrorists, brutal dictators, drug lords, they all care for and love their family and friends. Loving our family and friends, promoting their good, that's simply human life. That can't be what marks or distinguishes the people of God who are salt and light. That's not reflecting to God who is kind to those who are evil and spit on his face. His children, if he has any, would love others, even enemies, with his kind of love. These people would be salt and light. Children of your father. You see, children do what their parents do. They carry the family resemblance. This guy is a Formula One driver. His name is Mick. His surname is Schumacher. But it's little surprise that he's a Formula One driver because his dad is Michael Schumacher. 
He was just walking in his father's footsteps. And God's children do the same in terms of love. Now, we all know this passage, love your enemies. Everyone knows it. The problem is, it's really hard to be that loving and to be that good. It's hard enough, to be honest, to love the people you love. Never mind enemies. And actually, for most of us, the passage is kind of like unrealistic or we ignore it or we just put it somewhere. But here Jesus seems to be saying that his followers, not the super saints, become those type of people. The type of people who love their enemies. Jesus isn't ignoring it, isn't putting it off somewhere. He wants to bring us into it. He wants to bring us into that kind of life, his kind of life. You see, when Jesus was on the cross and he prayed, Father, forgive them, was that hard for Jesus? It actually wasn't. What would have been hard for Jesus is to curse them. Father, just curse them for what they're doing. That would have been hard for Jesus. You see, Jesus was the kind of person who loves his enemies. And God so loved the world, which is full of people who are spitting on his face, that he gave his only son. And it's not surprising that God loves his enemies. That's simply who he is. What would be surprising if God didn't love his enemies? You see, it actually wouldn't be hard for you and me to love our enemies if we were the kind of person Jesus was. If we were good with Jesus' kind of goodness. If we had the goodness of a kingdom heart. And unless we are good in that way, this loving our enemies, it's not very hard. It's impossible. And to become that kind of person who is good with Jesus' goodness, we need, to quote Alice Willard, to be substantially transformed in the depths of our being. No tweaking, but profound transformation, metamorphosis. The transformation that has to take place in our thoughts and in our feelings, in our dispositions, in our perspectives, even in our bodies. And if what a, that transformation results in our mind, our body, our soul, our heart being permeated with love. And when that happens, loving our enemies isn't hard. And this is where the Sermon on the Mount and all the illustrations have always been going. Up till now, Jesus has been giving a series of illustrations, and they're illustrations of a certain kind of heart, a certain kind of person. It's the heart, the kind of a heart, of a person who's permeated, possessed by love, or to use the uh, a biblical word agape love, the type of love God has. These people, though, don't try to love their enemy. You become a person possessed, permeated by love, who naturally loves their enemies. It's the heart of someone who's family with God. And then, how do we get there? How do we become that type of person? You know, when Jesus called his disciples in, in uh, Mark chapter 3, it says he called them to him and he called them to be with him. He called his followers to himself that they might be with him so he could give them his kind of life. To quote Dallas Willard, and I've been really uh, uh, dependent on Dallas Willard's teaching through all this series. He says, Jesus calls us to him to impart himself to us. He does not call us to do what he did, but to be who he was, permeated with love. Then doing what he did and said becomes a natural expression of who we are in him. So if you could imagine a drone, I know this, but if you could imagine a drone up high and hovering over the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, or actually all of Jesus' teaching, you would see the drone would show you that Jesus isn't talking about trying to keep a law or trying to get people to behave, trying to get them to love their enemies. Instead, what you would see is Jesus saying, become this kind of a person, become a son, a daughter of God, the God who is kind to his enemies. So we don't come to our enemies and try to love them. We are the kind of people who love enemies. And this is the last illustration that Jesus gives. Now remember, it's not laws, but illustrations of a kind of person, a kind of goodness, the goodness of a kingdom heart. And Jesus 
ends the illustrations with what the illustrations were pointing to. The goodness that's beyond the goodness of the Pharisees, beyond mere human goodness, pointing to the goodness of God. He says, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's his intention. He's not aiming at anything less, even if we want less. Now, as we've been on this journey, hopefully, if you've been with us every week and thinking about what we're covering here, you might be getting a whole new understanding of the kind of life Jesus is inviting us into, what it means to live in the kingdom of God and how that works. Hopefully, you'll beginning you'll be beginning to see areas in your understanding where your lens was, how do I obey these laws? And you're increasingly letting go of that understanding and in its place you're using a lens of being an apprentice into a kind of life. And hopefully, if you've been journeying with us and your understanding has been deepening, of the understanding and responding to the boundless riches of Christ, you are experiencing less condemnation, less feeling like you're failing to meet a standard, less living, like the, living as if the Christian life is all about trying to be good. And you're experiencing more joy, more forgiveness, more mercy, more kindness that comes from knowing that you're an apprentice, an accepted apprentice of Jesus. You're more freedom and you're experiencing that changing how you relate to other people. And hopefully now, as we've done this journey, these last words of chapter 5, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, that you're beginning to see that that's not some impossible standard we have to try and reach or some standard we're being measured against. Instead, it's kind of like a promise. It's kind of like an invitation. It's kind of like a training program. This is the kind of person Jesus is, in trans is transforming you into. Not because you're trying so hard, because it's not about trying, trying, but because you're being with Jesus, learning from Jesus, doing what Jesus did. This is a quote I used from C.S. Lewis in the previous weeks in Mere Christianity. He quotes this uh, last verse in uh, Matthew 5. The command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor it is, a, is it a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command, if we let him, for we can prevent him, if we choose. He will make the feeblest and the filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine a bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we are in for, nothing less. He meant what he said. And Jesus is doing just that, making us perfect like our Father, if we will let him. Don't worry about not being perfect yet, it takes a few weeks. This is the journey of an apprentice. It's your journey if you want it. And what I'd like to do is just do a kind of a transition and help you get a bigger picture of what God is doing in renewing of all the renewing of all things. And th that picture includes you and your life because you're part of it. And as I said, I'm indebted to Dallas Willard and his writings as he's mentored us. And one of the books is called The Divine Conspiracy. And I always understood what divine meant. It's like of God. And a conspiracy is a group of people who have a kind of secret plan. But it, the, the title of it didn't make sense. And I heard him explaining it. And how he explained it, he says, The divine conspiracy is God's secret plan revealed in Jesus to intervene in human history and overcome evil by good, through his church and his people being permeated with his kind of life. Evil is in the process of being overcome, not by stronger evil or by retaliation, but by good. And that good, that will to good, is what love is. And you know, throughout this series, we've gone back to the very beginning in Genesis a few times to see God's original intention for humanity. Because that's what Jesus is restoring. And in Genesis 1.27, it tells us, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
and Bible experts have done a lot of work on the meaning of this word image. Uh, the Hebrew word, if I pronounce it right, is telem. And when that word comes up in other places in the Old Testament, it usually refers to an idol. In other words, a carved image which is a copy of something that's not physical. The idol is the physical representation of the non-physical spiritual being it refers to. And we are idols, a statue or a copy of a non-spiritual being, and that non-spiritual being is God, Yahweh. Uh, two Old Testament scholars write about this, According to the meaning of the Hebrew word uh, telem, which stands for image, humans are to be in the world as a kind of living, living image or statue of God. That was our purpose, to be a living image or statue of God. We are God's idols, if you like, representations of God on earth. We get to be part of that in our ordinary everyday lives, overcoming evil with good. Not because we're trying to do good things, but because Jesus is transforming us by His Spirit into His image. The kind of people who are good on the inside, image bearers of the living God, bearing the family resemblance. You and me are so much more than we could ever imagine. God is making your heart to be His heart. His heart to be your heart. Think of that. This is Ezekiel in 32. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God is making his heart to be your heart. That sounds almost too holy to say. And the only way that happens is the way of apprenticeship to Jesus because he is making you into something you are not. So don't just try hard, because that doesn't work. Our effort, and it does require our effort, our effort goes into organizing our lives around being with Jesus, learning to be like Jesus, doing what Jesus did. In other words, we're not trying harder, we're being trained by Jesus. And I hope as we come to the end, of this second series in the trilogy, you're beginning to get a vision of who Jesus is and the kind of being, the kind of person he is making you to be. He will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love that we cannot now imagine. And he has started now is that the vision you have for your life because if it's not then you're not plugged into the reality of what god wants to do in you remember it's not about your trying harder it's simply about learning from jesus and allowing him to transform you so let me pray jesus that you would make our heart to be your heart. You would make us to be the kind of people that bear the family resemblance. So much so that is the natural thing for us to love our enemies. It seems like a foreign language, but it's what you're doing. Would you help us catch a vision of that? Lord, don't let us settle for less. We love you, Jesus. Amen.